the purple color is a, a color of royalty and this reminds us of Jesus uh, being the King of Kings. Along with that, purple also represents repentance and this is a time in which we should reflect on our lives. As we think of Jesus and the second coming, it is a time for us to look and see if there's things that we are doing that are wrong or things we can improve. So it's a time of repentance. The pink or rose colored candle represents joy. And finally, the white larger candle, uh, the color of white uh, represents holiness. Uh, it, it represents purity. Now each of these candles in themselves uh, represent uh, something. Our first uh, candle, the first can purple candle, is called the prophet's candle. And this reminds us of the hope we have in Christ. And the calls that we, we read in the Bible of the coming Messiah. The second uh, purple candle that we see here is called the Bethlehem candle. This symbolizes faith as we think of Mary and Joseph going all the way to Bethlehem. And uh, there you go. Our third candle is the shepherd's candle. And it is, uh, it is uh, the pink cam candle and it symbolizes joy. And finally, this uh, third purple candle, or the fourth candle of the Advent, is, uh, is uh, called the angel's candle. And it symbolizes peace. As we remember, the angels came pronouncing peace and saying, you know, sharing that good news with uh, the shepherds. Um, and finally, uh, when we look at the center candle, uh, this white larger candle, it's called the Christ candle, and it uh, represents Jesus. And so during Advent, we take time to count down the days until Christmas. We do that by lighting a candle each Sunday in that order. And on Christmas Eve, or sometimes Christmas Day, depending on the dates and how it falls, uh, we light the uh, Christ candle on that day. I'd like to read to you scripture. It is Malachi chapter 3, verse 1 to 4. That's Malachi chapter 3, verse 1 to 4. And then I'm going to light the candle, and then we will pray. Malachi 3, verse 1 to 4. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings uh, in righteousness. And the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in days gone by, as in former years. Join with me now in prayer. O oh Lord, on this first Sunday of Advent, we come to you with grateful hearts. This is a joyous time in which we count down the days leading to Christmas. Today, Father, as we gather to worship you, let our voices be strong as we sing your praises. Let our eyes and ears be open to your words of truth and to your teachings. And let our hearts be receptive to you so that we may receive all that you wish to give us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Jesus Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Now, 
This here uh, is a little glass container and inside this glass container is actual flakes of gold. To see, it's flakes of real gold. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, you know gold has a symbol to it. It means it points to something. So gold doesn't rust. It's not cor corruptible. It, you know, it won't uh, uh, be damaged over time. I've had this for years and years, and it looks exactly like the day I got it. Uh, well, gold represents a royalty, and this points to the fact that Jesus is the King of Kings. Now, the second gift, do you know what that was? What do you think the second gift is? Shout it out if you know what it is. It's frankincense. And so these wise men, these magi, came and they presented not only gold, but they presented to uh, this newborn king, Jesus, frankincense. And I don't know if you'll be able to see it from, uh, from where you are, but I've got it here. Frankincense is right here. Right? It is a whitish color. It's a, actually, it over time, it has yellowed a bit and, uh, since I've had it. But like I said, I've had this for years. I've had it for at least 10 years. And I remember the first time I saw this, that the frankincense was almost completely white. And frankincense is actually a tree resin. It's tree sap. You know, we have trees in Canada, like pine trees, that when you uh, are touching the bark and all that, your hands get sticky. Well, that's the same as this. This is tree sap that they've harvested from a tree. And uh, it's got a wonderful smell. I wish I could share, share that smell to you for you. Frankincense uh, is something that people used to burn, uh, and some people still do, but uh, they burn it for, say, because they just like the smell of it. But back in the biblical times, they used to burn the uh, frankincense because it gives off a really wonderful smell. And this was a fragrance offering to God, right? And so, Giving this to Jesus pointed to Jesus' Godhood, the fact that He is the Son of God. He's part of the Holy Trinity. He is God, the Son. So we see uh, that we have gold, which points to the fact that Jesus is royalty. He is the King of Kings, and we see that He is God's Son. He is the Son of God. One more uh, treasure to show you. So the last one that's here. Now, do you know what that one is? Shout it out if you know it. It's myrrh. Now myrrh, it's, it's sort of funny looking. It almost looks like rocks. And it's hard as well. Um, I've heard someone say it looks like brown popcorn. Uh, I don't know if I agree with it looking like brown popcorn. But you see it's kind of hard and chunky and uh, it's got a smell. It's got a smell to it too. Now, because I've had this so long, it doesn't very, smell very strong. But I remember when I first had it, it smelled really strong. And it's funny because um, looking at these gifts and looking at the difference between frankincense and myrrh, I sometimes get them mixed up. And my wife helped me to remember that myrrh looks murky. And that is, uh, that's the way I remember the difference between frankincense and myrrh when I'm opening these. So myrrh is a dark color and it's chunky and it's hard. And I, as I said, someone told me it looks like popcorn. Um, but to me, it just looks like chunks of rocks. Now myrrh, uh, again is tree sap. 
Just like our pine trees here in Canada have tree sap and it's all sticky. By the way, they have fr uh, frankincense and myrrh because they are processed. They're not sticky in your hand. I don't have anything sticky on my hand. Now, myrrh points to something else about Jesus. Back in biblical times, they used to use myrrh uh, as a, an embalming, in their embalming practices. It's something that they would use uh, to anoint a dead body, to put on a dead body. And this points to what Jesus was going to do. Jesus was going to, he came to the world to die for our sins. And so this pointed to his mission and the fact that he was going to suffer and die on the cross for us. Well, if you're wondering where this comes from, from the Bible, it comes from, uh, it is recorded in Matthew chapter 2, and I'm going to read verse 11, and I've talked a little bit about this, so it's not going to surprise you. But for Matthew chapter 2, verse 11 says, On coming to the house, and this is the Magi, the wise men, On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, of frankincense, and of myrrh. As I said, each of these point to something about Jesus. So it's wonderful to, to see that even when Jesus received his first gifts, it was pointing to who he was and what he was going to do. Alright, well I hope you enjoyed that. We're going to take a moment to pray. Dear God, it's fun getting presents, and it's, uh, you know, it's wonderful to see these presents that we've been able to kind of take a closer look at, the presents that Jesus received. We thank you for Jesus and for all that he ha has and is doing for us, and we just want to say that we love him, and we thank him, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
see bright west we leading still proceeding guide us to thy perfect light glorious now behold him arise king and god and scripture. Let's just take a moment to pray. Pray with me now. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, which we call the Bible. Thank you that you have given us your written revelation so that we can learn the truths that you want us to know. Speak to us today and let your spirit flow amongst us. Encourage us in our faith. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for praying with me. Friends, the Bible in relation to time is a funny thing. Most of us see the Bible as just one book, but in fact it is a collection of books. It's actually 66 books uh, in all. Now, most of us would say that the Bible is old. After all, we just have to look at our calendars. Our calendars are based on uh, the calculated date in which they people believe Jesus was born. And so um, you look at how long our calendar is. This year is 2021. And the calendar, by the way, began in year one. There is no z year zero in our, our calendar. It's 1 BC or 1 AD. And so when we look at um, uh, this fact that uh, the calendar is based on Jesus, and at least the New Testament, uh, which focuses on Jesus' birth, ministry, his uh, death and resurrection, and the events of the early church. You know, since the calendar is based on Jesus and all that, then it's got to be old. But in saying that, uh, we recognize that the Bible is made up of two sections. We have uh, that New Testament section, which focuses on Jesus, but we also have the Old Testament section, which uh, is all about the stuff that happened prior, before Jesus uh, was born. And so we know that the Bible is even older than that. Now, if we read uh, the Bible from cover to cover, if we start in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, in the beginning, and we go all the way to the very end of Revelation, it feels that um, it's one event after the other, just bing, 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 bing. Uh, but uh, there are huge time chunks in, in that in the Bible when we are reading, there's huge blocks of time. Like, for example, did you know that the time between what we call the Old Testament and the time that we call the New Testament? So, uh, the time in which the very last event happened in what's recorded in the Old Testament to the time that the very first event is recorded in the New Testament, that time frame in between is 400 years long. That's a massive amount of time. Now, just to put it in context, Canada uh, is 153 years old. Canada feels like it's been around for a long time, but it's only 153 years. And if you look at our neighbors to the south, the United States has been around for 244 years. So just think about that. We could take all of Canada 
Canada's history, all of United States history, we can add it up together. And that doesn't add up to 400 years. Not 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, why do I share this with you? Well, the scripture that we're going to be reading is from a book called Isaiah. And that is named after the prophet who wrote, in, wrote that book. And, he, and Isaiah shared the words that God had given him to share with the world. And in all these prophecies, and prophecies are words that talk about something that's going to happen. And in all these prophecies that Isaiah shared that God had given him, God had given him words to share about the Messiah, the Savior. And these are some of those words. Now remember, I just talked about time and why we're talking about time. I want you to know that Isaiah shared these words of hope for this com coming Messiah 700 years before Jesus was born. 700 years. Well, let's read Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7 to see what it actually says. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. One of my favorite Christmas stories comes from a book put together by Dr. James Dobson, the founder of Focus on the Family. The title of the story is If You're Missing Baby Jesus. It's by Jean Gitson, and I'm going to summarize it for you. I'm going to give you the Coles Notes version of it. It's a story that takes place in North Dakota in 1943. In this story, a family discovers after, the, after a move that their nativity uh, set is missing. And so they go to their uh, local five and dime where they pick up a new nativity set. Uh, and they go home, and when they go home, they discover that this nativity set has two baby figurines of Jesus. So they went back uh, to the store, and they explained that their nativity set had an extra figurine of Jesus, an extra Jesus. And uh, they figured that one of the other nativity sets that was there at the store might be missing one. So they, they asked the manager if they could put a sign to let people know that they had an extra Jesus. Now you can tell this is a story that took place all the way in 1943 for two reasons. First, what the manager does next, and second, by the phone number they uh, give them. So listen up. So as the story goes... The manager does put a, a sign on the display of these nativities. And he said, the sign simply says, If you're missing baby Jesus, call 7162. That's it, by the way. 7162. I figured you'd like the fact that their phone number was only four digits long. No one called. That is, on, until Christmas Eve, when they got a call from a young mother who called them for help. She had no heat in the house, no milk in the fridge, no toys under the Christmas tree, and she had three young children. She was in desperate need. The husband had ran off, and when he left, he took with him much of the bedding, and the clothing, and most of the furniture that was in their, their house. 
and he took off. As the story goes, this, it shares how this young mother had been doing her very best to keep their family together, to keep things going. And she did laundry and ironing for people around for a bit of extra cash. And she cleaned the local uh, five and dime that the family had purchased their nativity set from. The young mother told them, I saw your number every day there on those boxes uh, on the counter. Then the furnace went out. That number kept going through my mind. 7162. 7162. It said on the box that if a person was missing Jesus, they should call you. That's how I knew you was good Christian people, willing to help folks. I figured that maybe uh, you'd be able to help me too. And as the story goes, the family did indeed help this young mother with what she needed. This young mother and her kids. They rallied the community. They got the furnace going. They filled the fridge with food. They gave them warm clothes to wear and some furniture and even toys for the children to open on Christmas Day. I really summarized that story, but I got to tell you, that always kind of chokes me up. It's one of those wonderful stories of hope. Hope is a powerful thing. Hope gives us confidence. Hope gives us security. Hope gives us peace. Through Though we may not be able to see God like we see other human beings, hope allows us to see God through spiritual eyes, to feel God within us. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Back in 2019, I hiked the entire length of the 900 kilometer Bruce Trail. Now, I didn't do it all at once. But I would go out there, hike after hike after hike. I started in Niagara on the Lake and worked my way all the way up to Tobermory. This is in Ontario. And I did it, as I said, one hike at a time. And I was able to complete this adventure of the Bruce Trail. I was able to complete this adventure because I had support. I had help from my wonderful wife who would often drop me off at my starting point of each hike. And every time but one, she picked me up at the end of the day. Well, as I was working my way up, I got to this area that was is close to Wyerton, Ontario. You may have heard of Wyerton. That's famous for Groundhog Day. There's Wyerton Willie there. And when I was close, but I was out there in the bush, and I uh, was getting close to the end of my day. I had hiked uh, over 40 kilometers, and I got to say, you know, my legs were tired, and my feet were killing me. It was some pretty rugged terrain. And so my wife knew that that was where she had to meet me, was right at the end of this uh, section and I had given her the uh, exact location I put it in her GPS and so she had plugged it in and the GPS took her all over the place until they it actually took her on what's called um, it is like an unfinished road and uh, basically it was almost a dirt trail uh, and it had potholes and what made matters worse was it was very heavy with forest, very thick forest all around. And there was a lot of rock up there. So our cell phones were working sporadically. Uh, I would send her a text and she wouldn't be able to receive it. And all of a sudden she'd get it way after I sent it. 
I might have sent a couple of texts and they came in different orders and she would do the same thing. And to make it even more worse, by that time of day, my cell phone battery was running low. And uh, I was afraid that we were going to get completely disconnected. And so after doing all that hiking, just feeling that anxious feeling in my heart, knowing my wife was stuck somewhere um, between potholes and rocks and trees and all that, uh, I started to run down all these country roads looking for where she could possibly be. It's funny, adrenaline does a lot for you, and so those tired legs of mine and that those sore feet were full of energy as I jogged down one way and then another way and crossing another street and up that street and down that way. And I finally was able to manage to text my some family who came because I was able to give them the exact street location. And they came, and together... We were able to find my wife for no worse or where, and uh, we were able to get the car turned around and slowly drive the way she came to get out of the that undeveloped road. Uh, and so it all worked out. Uh, no one was hurt. But what was amazing about all that was the feelings I had, that feeling of anxiousness, a sense of almost a panic welling up deep inside me that was starting to bubble up going I gotta find my wife I gotta make sure she's okay and then during all that time of running as I was looking I was praying to God and I was praying and this sense of peace flowed throughout me it, it, I just know Jesus is my hope he is my Lord, and in Him I trust. I knew everything was going to be okay. You know, though I didn't know where Tina was, though I didn't know where my wife was, I knew she would be okay. And as I said, in time, we found her, and she was totally fine, and uh, we were able to get out of, out of the forest. Hope gives us to the ability to endure the pain and suffering that we may experience in the present because we know that the future belongs to God and we know we belong to Him. The Bible says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long, and we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friends, there was a man named William Tyndale. He was a man that all of us who speak English should be thankful for because he was instrumental in helping to translate the Bible into English. Tyndale was born in England in 1494. He was a priest and a scholar, and at that time, uh, when he was alive, there was a law that forbade people to translate the Bible into English. Yet this uh, was exactly what Tyndale wanted to do. This is what he felt God had called him to do. Tyndale wanted to make it possible that even the simple farmhand would be able to access the Bible. I think that is a wonderful vision that everyone would be able to read for themselves God's Word. Well, to do this, Tyndale had to give up his home. He had to leave England, and he went to Germany, and there he, he worked hard at translating uh, the New Testament. 
and he had to eventually uh, escape there from those who wanted uh, to capture him. There was British or English spies, I should say, English spies uh, were after him even in Germany. And eventually Tyndale got caught. He, uh, he, he had someone befriend him who acted like his friend, but in the end it was this uh, friend who betrayed him. And Tyndale was arrested and he was thrown in prison where he was left for a year and a half. Remember, all of this was just to translate the Bible <coughs> into English. And eventually he was sent up, he was he went to trial <coughs> and uh, trial for heresy in 1536 and he was condemned and executed on October 6. He was uh, strangled and then um, burned at the stake. Tyndale's last prayer um, to God before he was executed wasn't a prayer in which he wished God would punish those who had inflicted pain on him. It wasn't uh, to get out of uh, jail, so to speak, to avoid uh, this uh, death sentence. Tyndale's last prayer was this. These are the words, and they were recorded. He simply said, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. You want to know something crazy? Three years later, in 1539, King Henry VIII required every parish church in England to make a copy of the English Bible available to all parishioners. God answered Tyndale's prayer. Hope gives us meaning. Hope gives us purpose. As the Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians 1.21, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Now when I do my sermon prep, I, I use the New International Version, but I read other translations of the Bible. One of the ones I go to uh, almost every Sunday is the Amplified. And I have a, that same verse, Philippians 1.21, which I just read. I thought I'd share with you the Amplified Version as it gives a little bit more detail of what that means. Remember, the NIV says, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. The Amplified Version says, For to me, to live is Christ. He is my source of joy, my reason to live. And to die is gain. For I will be with him in eternity. In this day and age when evil abounds and the future of the world seems so uncertain, we can hold on to our hope in Christ. He has promised to come again. And that gives us meaning for what we go through and it gives us purpose. God's word declares that one day Jesus will come again. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Hope. It is hope that encourages us to reach out to God, to open ourselves to his call. It is hope that gives us confidence, not just for today, but for the future. It is hope that gives us security. It is hope that gives us peace. Hope is what allows us to feel God's love inside us. It is hope that gives us the ability to endure the pain and suffering we may experience in this present time. Uh, because we can hold on to the fact that the future belongs to God and we belong to Him. It is hope that gives us meaning and purpose for our lives. So, my call to you is to hold on to hope. Hold on to Jesus. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you for the hope we have in Christ. Thank you that He is always there for us. Thank you for the ways you encourage us in our hope.
for the strength you give us and the meaning and purpose we have because of you. Thank you for the hope that we have. Thank you for Jesus. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.